So all of heaven is watching the earth all the time, looking for a man or a woman that's going to use the Word of God, that's going to speak the Word of God, that's going to move on the Word of God. And when they do, heaven moves. Three years ago, right here in the United States of America, I mean the red, white, and blue, land of the free, home of the brave. I mean, I mean, our government attacked the church and the middle class. Yes, sir. Yep. And they said you can go to Lowe's, you can go to Sam's, you can go to Costco, you can go to Walmart, you can go to, uh, but you go to church, you'll die. Yeah. Hello. And if you go to church, shame on you because you're a murderer. You're trying to kill everybody else. And if you go to a mom and pop store, you'll die. Don't you go to a local mom and pop store. And I said, uh -huh, I've seen this devil. I know that devil. I've known that devil for over half a century. Attack the church, attack the middle class. In Michigan, that same year, the three years ago in Michigan, they lost 60,000 mom and pop stores. It'll never come back. Many churches will never come back. Renee and I were preaching in Lake Charles, Louisiana a few months back, and, and the week we were there preaching, three big churches in town that had closed down when COVID started and never opened back up again, the week we were there, they made the announcement that we're done, we'll never be back. Don't fall for that nonsense. Amen. Now when I'm talking about Mr. Obama, I'm not talking politics, I'm talking history. He said that. Yeah. Right. Right. Hello. Right? I mean, I don't care what party belongs to or what color his skin is he you know communist is a communist right. <laughs> you know right. remember how he told us not to pray do not pray yeah. president of the united states saying do not pray he said you need to have moments of silence angie uh -huh. now what good does that do here dennis i'm gonna send you a message yeah. <laughs> did you get that of course not do not pray, but have moments of silence. Well, see, if I was the devil, that's what I'd have said. Yeah, hello. Because God said, I create the fruit of the lips. Because Jesus said, you can have what you say. Paul said, the word of faith speaks. Yes, it does. So if I was the devil, I'd say, don't talk. Don't pray. Hey, have a moment of silence. See, a moment of silence, nothing wrong with a moment of silence, but it, it's to show honor and respect. Yes, yeah. If we were at a funeral in here today and they brought the casket down here, I'd stand up and just do like this. There's nothing to say. So I'd just show honor. I'd just show respect. You know, if they brought an American flag down here today, I, the first thing I'd do, I, I was, I'm a veteran, I'd just snap to and I can't help it. I can't help doing that. Amen. Amen. My good friend Mark Barkley, I don't know if y'all know Mark or not. Mark was a Marine drill sergeant. And, and on, on, his, on his phone, when he's preaching, his, his timer is taps. <laughs> and so every time I'm listening to him preach and that goes off, I tell Renata, I said, every time that happens, I'm sitting there listening to him preach. When that goes off, I just got to straighten up in my chair. And, <laughs> I mean, I can't help it. <laughs> But that's a moment of silence. It's to show honor. It's to show respect. But it doesn't do anything. What if we were 100,000 of us in a football stadium? And all of a sudden there was an active shooter at the mall or a school killing people. And one of the announcers said, folks, stand up and hold hands. We're going to, uh, there's an active shooter shooting kids down here at the school. Let's all have a moment of silence. So what would happen? Nothing. What would heaven do? Nothing. Heaven would be saying, say something. Loose us. Send us. Give us authority. Say something. Because heaven just stand there. Can't do it. Can't do anything. 
Does that make sense? Yes, sir. But what if he said, folks, there's a shooter down here. Everybody stand up and hold hands, and we're going to pray for the blood of the covenant and the covenant of blood, and we're stopping that demon right now in the name of Jesus. Well, we, we'd stop that. Come on. Go ahead. Amen. Amen. That's why I'm telling you the iron did swim. Yes, sir. The iron did swim. Anyway, I was in Cuba in, in, in the spring of 03. Lynn was with me. In the spring of 03, and, and 13 men have always run Cuba. Fidel Castro, his brother Raul, and then 11 other guys. And I know several of those guys. A lot of them are dead now. But I, I know several of them, and one of them really, really, well, a couple of them really like me. One of them that really, really, really likes me, Jim, is the head of the Communist Party. I don't even want him to like me. <laughs> when I first got out of the Army, I went straight to, the, to Mexico to the mission fields. And uh, I, I spent time with a missionary named Wayne Myers. Wayne's 100 years old this year, still preaching. And I ran into a lifestyle that absolutely pricked my heart, grabbed hold of me. I saw a, a man that was living to give. I mean, he, he, was, he was living his life on planet Earth with the purpose of blessing somebody, lifting somebody, embracing somebody. And I saw that. I said, ah, this is it. I, this is the, I'm, I'm embracing this. And I right there made a vow to God and to myself. And I said, this is how I will live the rest of my life, living to give because it's the very nature of God. So I want to encourage you to hook up with that same lifestyle of giving. I mean, embrace it, living to give. And you can give to your local church. You can give to other ministries. I've partnered with ministries since around the world since I was a teenager. And I tell you, God's blessed me for it. I wouldn't trade it. You can also partner with us. We're always happy to em embrace partners. We pray for them every day. But as long as you hook up with that concept, that lifestyle of God, living to give, then it'll be a blessing to others and it'll certainly be a blessing to you. And so when I'm in Cuba, he'll say, send for Dr. Myers to come have coffee with me. And I'll go down to his office. Just... And he's a real horseman, loves horses. Has a big ranch that I'm sure he stole from somebody. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's what they did in 1959 when, when they took over. Then they went and took people's homes from them. All the mansions, all I've stayed in those mansions because they call them government protocol houses. So when I go to Cuba now, they say, Dr. Miles, we want you to stay in a government protocol house. And I say, and I know why you want me to, because you've got video cameras in there and you used to watch everything I do and hear everything I say. Nobody's better than communists at, 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 at surveillance. They're the best. I get out of the shower, I go... <laughs> in fact over all the years pastor I've never let my wife or my daughters go to Cuba with me never never let them go I've had some partners you know that wanted to go with me I said eh, you better not I had one lady said no I'm going her and her husband said I'm going I said, I'm telling you there's video cameras oh we don't believe that brother Terry I said I'm telling you there's video cameras you don't believe me I'm your friend you're my partner you send me money and you don't believe me Yeah. I want to go said, okay go so they came with me. We had great meetings. God did miracles. It was wonderful. And one day I was down, we was at a hotel this time. I was, I was down at the hotel the front desk one day, and they came down to the front desk with me, and, and I was doing something there. And, and then I said, do y'all got a couple of minutes? And I said, I said, oh, sure, Brother Terry. I said, well, come go with me. And I went, I went to the elevator and opened the door, punched the button for a certain floor, went up there, and, and they said, where are we going? I said, come with me. We go down the hallway, and I open the door and, and walk in, and there's two or three guys at desk with monitors all over three walls watching all the rooms. I say, which room is whatever their room number was, you know, 427 or whatever. And they all oh, that one up there. Because wow. those guys at the hotel know me and like me. <laughs> I've been there so many times. And so, uh, you know, that lady just lost it. She just went pale. Uh, she said, you were serious? I said, of course I was serious. I told you. <laughs> But they're good at surveillance, you know. You need to know your enemy. Yeah. But anyway, he's always want me to go ride horses with him, and I've never gone. Every time I say, no, sir, thank you, I need to be, I need to be doing some stuff. I've got, I came over here to do certain things I need to do. I've even got the KGB in, in, my, in, in, in my favor in, in Cuba. KGB likes me. They sent me a card one time with their private numbers on it, and they, they told a the pastor, they said, scared the pastor out of his mind. They thought he was going to get arrested. And he said, no, 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 we're, we're, we're good. He said, we know you're a friend of Terry Myers. He said, no, 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 no. They said, we know, we know, 
We know you're a friend of Terry Mize. It's okay. We like Terry Mize. It's okay. They said, but they said, but we're having a problem. And it was right back several numbers of years ago now when Pat Robertson got on television and he made this statement. He said, you know, Hugo Chavez, who of course is in hell now. Uh, he said, you know, Hugo Chavez, the leader of, of, of Venezuela, he is such a bad guy. He said, the United States should have killed him and taken him out a long time ago. And Pat said that on TV. So of course they're watching TV in Cuba, watching Christian TV. And so they're all mad at Pat Robertson. And so the KGB said, we're having a problem now. I said, Pat Robertson just got on TV and said, said that the United States should have killed Hugo Chavez. And I said, yeah, I know. And they, said, and they said, well, you know, Hugo's Fidel's only friend. And so Fidel's not happy. So next time Terry Mize comes to town, ask him not to say Terry Mize ministry. Because the president relates that to Pat Robertson ministry. He said, just tell him to say Terry Mize Faculty died, faculty, and it, which has a different connotation in Spanish than it does in English. And in Cuba, it, it actually means a school and all the school grounds, the campus, all the teachers and everything else. It's about teaching. So he said, just tell Terry Mize that when he wants to come here and minister, don't use the word ministry, just say Terry Mize faculty. And they said, here's a number, tell him he gets in trouble, call this number and we'll help him out. So I said, I got the KGB working for me, man, or working, working with me, you know. So, but uh, anyway, so I was in the office of one of these gentlemen. Lynn and I were in his office, and uh, and so I said, Hey, uh, uh, Mr. Leal, I'll use his name now because he died a couple of years ago. I said, Mr. Leal, uh, I said Cuba has never ever had Christmas since 1958. Last time you had Christmas, 1958. He said, Yeah, that's right. I said, silent, and I've been silent for 45 years. And he said, yes. And I said, I've got an idea. I said, let me bring you a Christmas tree this year, and it'll be a, uh, it'll be a gift from the Christians in America to the people of Cuba. He said, oh, no, Dr. Mize, we can't do that. I said, oh, come on, let's do it. Oh, no, no. I'll bring a 40-foot tree. We'll set it up. No, Dr. Mize, no, we can't do that. And so over the next 30, 40 minutes, drinking coffee, uh, I, I pitched it to him another six, seven, eight times. And every time he said, no, 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 no. How many of you ladies know how to cook pasta? This isn't a trick question. I mean, real pasta cookers. How do you, how do you tell when pasta's done? Like any good Italian mama. Throw it against the wall. And so when you take pasta and throw it against the wall, if it's done, it'll, it'll, it'll stick. And if it's not done, it'll slam down the wall. Well, I've always seen myself... All these 55 years, I see myself that God's given me a pasta throwing ministry. <laughs> and so all over the world, I go into these leaders and people, and that's what I was doing that day, and I just walk in there and pitch pasta against the wall and give them some idea, you know, and they shoot it down, and I, the pasta goes... <sniffs> and so I did that that day. I said, I said, hey, Mr. Leal, let's, let's have a Christmas tree. <laughs> you know, I'm seeing myself. <sniffs> and he's, oh, no, no, Dr. Mother, and so I'm seeing... <laughs> And so six or eight more times, let's do it. No, let's don't do it. Let's do it. Let's don't do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And so I left there and told Lynn, I said, well, that didn't work. You know, <laughs> it all slimed down the wall. And uh, so I went home. That was spring of 04. And I went home. And in June, I have a son that was killed in a car wreck. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, my world was fell apart and, and I forgot about Cuba and forgot about Christmas and Christmas trees and everything. I didn't even think about it again. And so as it got closer to December, I said, uh, I said to Jackie, I said to my wife, I said, I don't want to stay home for Christmas this year. I said, you know, we're going to be without Paul and, and, uh, you know, it's not going to be right and not going to be good and not going to be fun. And, and I said, let's just take the whole family to Florida. Let's just take the kids, grandkids and go to Disney World for Christmas. And so she said, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love that. So we took off, took all the kids and grandkids and went to, went to Florida. And so the very end of a few days of, of November, I get an email from this guy, Mr. Leal, Ebisulio Leal. And he said, Dr. Mize, if your offer of the Christmas tree is still good, we'd like to have it. And I'm thinking, Christmas tree, what? I hadn't even thought about it, man. And uh, he said, and we would like you to personally bring it. He said, not a 40-footer, only a 20. And he said, uh, 
he said, we want you to get it here on December 10th, which is a Cuban holiday. And he said, uh, uh, and we, we'll have, there's only one, one TV station in the whole nation. He said, we'll have the TV station there. They'll film it. Everybody in the nation will see it. Only one channel. Everybody will see it. And, uh, and he said, we want you to tell us the Christmas story. And I thought, I said to my wife, I said, do they know what the Christmas story is? <laughs> I mean, President Castro made it a, an atheist state and a communist state in 1963. Atheists don't believe in God. The Christmas story is about Jesus. He said, and after you finish that and have a tree lighting ceremony, then we want you to be the first American in 45 years to go into a government building with government permission and have a church service. Yeah. Now, 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 don't take me wrong. Other Americans have gone to Cuba and preached, but nobody in the government building with government permission. Yeah. You know, it's always underground. I've done that for 20 years myself, you know. And they've come to arrest me. And I, Well, I don't have time to. In fact, I really don't have time. I don't have time to tell all that stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I've only had two enemies all my ministry, and that's the clock and the calendar. <laughs> And they're just always marching, always marching. And the longest service I've ever had is ten and a half hours. So, so you know, I'm I'm not feeling that anointing this morning. But you'd like it. <laughs> you'd like it. It was good. People still come to me. One came to me just last week. Renee, I introduced her to Wizard Brother Coburn's meeting last week, a week before, and I introduced her to this guy in Australia. And he told Renee, he said, "I was there the Wednesday night." Yeah. <laughs> you know, they always refer to it as the Wednesday night. You know. <clears throat> but anyway, I said that I called the family together, the kids and grandkids and, you know, Jackie. And I said, what do you want me to do? I said, you know, here's this opportunity to change history and make history. But I don't leave you all since we don't have a Paul at Christmas. And it's not fun. What do you want me to do? And they, they, everyone said, go to Cuba and win souls and give the devil a black eye or... <laughs> over over Paul being gone, yeah. and uh, and so I did. We 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 I got on the internet and found a Christmas tree farm in Canada because I couldn't do it from America because President Kennedy had put a, an embargo on Cuba back in 1963. So so I got this uh, Christmas tree farm in Canada and I called the owner and said, "Can you do this?" I said, "I know Air Air Havana, Air Havana flies to Canada and I know Air Canada flies to Havana. So can you ship a Christmas tree for me?" And he said, "Well, if I had the paperwork, I could, but not without paperwork. I, said, I can get you the paperwork." And, but I just need to know if you can do it because I'm on the clock here. And he said, I can do it. And I said, do you sell decorations? He said, yes. I said, all right. And I ordered all these decorations, 20-foot tree. And I said, I want a big star on the top for obvious reasons. I said, I want you to give me big red bows. I'm going to talk about the blood of Jesus. I want these big red red bows. And so we 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 took, flew that. It cost thousands of dollars. They gouged me on the price. And, and I flew that Christmas tree to, to Havana. And the military police met it at the airport. And they gave it two motorcycle policemen in front of it, two motorcycle policemen behind it, and took it down with sirens blaring down to the to the waterfront of the Malecon and set it up in St. Francis de Assisi Square and uh, decorated it. And I flew in there, and we had, oh, my goodness, we had a Christmas tree decorating uh, lighting ceremony, and I preached and told the Christmas story and, and talked about the blood of Jesus and talked about the star and talked about, the, you know. And, and then when we got through with that, then we went into a beautiful old museum, gorgeous old museum, and had church, and uh, it was just wonderful. And then uh, uh, the next spring, we were back there again. Lynn was with me again, and uh, we were just walking downtown Old Havana. And uh, so many pastors came to me just in tears, saying, "We saw it on television. We haven't heard those songs since we were children. Our children have never heard those songs. It's illegal." And said, "It's just so marvelous." So we even came to Havana on a little vacation to see the tree because they kept it up for a long time as a tourist attraction. You know, kept trying to keep it alive. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we was walking downtown, and Lynn said, Dad, isn't that Mr. Lay all over there? Because there was a ribbon-cutting ceremony that was open in a building. And I said, that is him. And so we walked over there, and, and he said, Dr. Mize. And I said, Senor Lay, well, he said, are you going to bring us another Christmas tree? Because it's in Spanish. You can bring us another Christmas tree this year? And I said, con su permiso, with your permission. And he said, claro, okay, see, of course. And so we brought it again in 05, did the same thing, big deal, wonderful, marvelous. And uh, now I see partners all the time. They'll say, 
Brother Terry, you still taking the Christmas tree to Cuba? And I said, no. I said, I did it in 04 and 05. Never had to do it again because now if you go to Christmas and go to Cuba on Christmas, you'll see trees and lights and you'll hear songs and, and because we reset the post. You know, the Bible says don't move the post that the ancient, that the fathers have said. We, we put the post back where it belonged. And, and we change history. The church should always make history and always change history. Amen. Well, my old clock's running. Let me just say this real quick. Uh, in 74, I'll, I'll, I'll get back on this tonight, but let me just give you a highlight. Uh, I was 24, and Jackie and I lived in Mexico as missionaries, and, and, uh, and I, I had gone to the States and come back with an organ and a PA system for our work there, and I spent the night in a little town called Zacatecas. Zacatecas now is a big town, but it was a little town then. And so as I left the next morning, early the next morning, I grabbed a tape of Kenneth Copeland, stuck it in a tape player on the integrity of the Word of God, and and as I got on the outside of town to get on the highway, I, and I turned on to the highway, uh, there was a Mexican man standing there hitchhiking. So I thought, well, I ought to pick that guy up and tell him about Jesus. That's what I'm in Mexico for. So I pulled over. He got in. We took off. And I'm, I'm just driving pretty fast and, and just not even paying attention to him. I'm just thinking in Spanish. So I got to witness to him in Spanish. And so I finally had to figure out what I wanted to say. And I turned to say it. And when I did, he just reached in his coat like this and pulled out a pistol. And he cocked the hammer on the pistol and reached over and jammed it in my ribs hard. He just went pow like that and grabbed my collar like that. So I'm driving the car and he's got me, he's got me over like this and in the pistol here and screamed at me and he said, I'm going to kill you. Te voy a matar. And it made me mad. I was 24 years old and, and uh, uh, got a wife and two babies in Guadalajara. And, and so, and I said, uh, I'm a man of God and I've got authority over you in the name of Jesus. You can't kill me. And he, he that made him mad. And so he yanked on my collar and poked me again and said, I said, I'm going to kill you. And I said, and I said, I'm a man of God and I've got authority over you in the name of Jesus. You can't kill me. So anyway, we went on down the highway for a while and a lot of things happened. And I said this and that and the other and told the Lord some stuff. And, and uh, uh, finally he said, just pull off the road, get off the road. He was so mad. Everything he said to me, I answered him with the word, which made him mad. And, uh, and so we pulled off the road and he said, get out. And we met at the front of the car. And I'm just leaning up against the car, just praying in the Holy Ghost. I don't know what to do. I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost, you know, using the blood, the name, the word, the covenant. <laughs> and then use the blood, the name, the word, and the covenant. And you, then use the blood, the name, the word, the covenant. <laughs> and just keep doing that till you win. Yeah. And uh, so he said, well, give me your money, your, your sunglasses, your jewelry. Give me everything. So I did. And, and I'm still leaning up against the car. And he walked up close to me. And I stuck my finger right in his face. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And when I did, he took the gun barrel of that gun and hit me in the forehead hard, you know, pow, like that. And just knocked me over the top of my car and it hurt, man. I'm seeing stars, you know. And I'm laying there on the hood of my car like this, and he puts the gun in my forehead and the camera cocked and, and he screamed at me and he said, You shut up. If you say one more word, I'll kill you. And I pushed up off the car and stepped into him and I stuck my finger back in his face, passed his gun, and I said, I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You can't kill me. You can't hurt me in any way. And when I said that, he just jumped backwards a couple of steps. And we weren't nose to nose, but he just jumped, jumped back, you know, close, close I am to pastor right now, and shot at me five times at point blank range, center mass. And the bullets didn't hit me. Now, I don't know what happened to the bullets. Don't know how God did that. Don't care how God did that. <laughs> That's been 49 years ago, and I've never asked the Lord, how'd you do that? I don't care. Yeah. Not even my job. My job's to believe it, to decree it, which I've been doing, and to believe it. Anyway, the story goes on from there, and I'll, I'll pick up on it tonight. Hmm? <laughs> That's so encouraging. You know, you know something? Uh, for about the last 10, 15 years, is I've traveled in America, and we go out to lunch, and pastors or pastors' wives or people say, Brother Jerry, how do you find the church in America? I hate that question because I haven't found it very good. I mean, I just, it's just not doing so good. It's, in, it's on life support. You know, it's not doing so good. And, and I've really been disappointed in the church in America. But this last, this last summer, we went out to California, and, uh, and, and I texted Nancy, the frame and said, hey, we're going to be preaching in uh, 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 San Diego, which is about 30 miles from where she lives. And I said, uh, one day this week, I said, uh, let, can Renee and I run, are you going to be home? Renee and I run up and, and take you to lunch, take you to dinner. She takes me right back. She said, that's my camp meeting week. Can you speak for me? And I said, well, yeah, but that's not the point of the text. But 
I can. And so we went. And uh, I was just so amazed at how the church was hungry. There, there, there's what I call surface noise in churches. To where when the people are through, it doesn't matter if you're through or not, the people get through at a certain time. And so you hear Bible zippers and you hear purse zipping and you hear people gathering their stuff up and, and they're, they're done. So you might as well quit. And, and so, and there was none of that in that meeting. None. And I preached for what, two hours or better? Some of y'all probably saw it online. I preached for over two hours, and just, an hour and 40 minutes. And, and there's none of that, man. And they're just saying, preach. So, so then Nancy called me after midnight uh, one night and, at the hotel, and she said, could you preach for uh, one of my guys, uh, Noel Ramos, in San Diego Sunday? And she said, are you preaching somewhere Sunday? I said, no, we're going to go to your church and hear Morgan preach. And she said, could you go? And I said, well, I can, but we really wanted to just go to your church and hear Morgan preach. And she said, well, I'd really appreciate it if you'd go preach for Brother Noel. <laughs> and I said, sure, whatever you want. I'll, I'll be glad to do it. So we went down there. Same thing. They just wouldn't quit. Yeah. They were just hungry. So, so we went and preached several places in California. We got up in close to Merced with the 60, 70 miles, and Deborah Simons called me. And she said, I, I know you got to put someplace this Sunday and next Sunday. Could you do me a, a Tuesday and Wednesday service? And I said, well, I guess I can. So, so again, two nights in a row, the, you know, and I'd met Jay Everly there. And so he said, can you come to Iowa? And I said, I'm actually driving from Portland, Oregon, all the way to the East, East Coast. Philadelphia, and I'll go right through your town. And he said, well, stop and preach for me. So we did. And I went for a couple of hours and, and kept trying to quit. And they said, no, preach, preach, no, preach, no, preach. And the guy behind the camera, I never did see his head because the camera's bigger than him. But he'd, every now and then I'd slow down and he'd, he'd put his arm out like this and do it like this. And so in every church, almost every church I've been to since then, there's just been no surface noise. People don't want to quit. And I've been more encouraged over, over the church in America than I have been in a long, 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 long time. A amen. Well, anyway, in the car, I had said, you know, you can't kill me, this and there. And I, and I was just praying in tongues the whole time. Can I still preach? And I just let him preach. I figured it's a good time to hear it. And so, and I said, and I said to the Lord, and then this guy said to me, he said, what's the matter with you? Aren't you scared? No tens me, though? And I said, they, they want you to be scared. And I said, no. I said, I'm, I'm not scared. What should I be scared of? I said, you, all you've got is a loaded gun. I've got the name of Jesus. I win. Hello, everybody. Renee and I just want to remind you that the greatest miracle of all time and the only eternal miracle is salvation. So uh, let's just do that right now. Pray this prayer after me. Father God. I come before you today to accept Jesus. I believe in my heart Jesus is the Son of God. I call on you today according to your word. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Make me a new creature. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and I'll serve you the rest of my days in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says you're saved, you're born again. So write us, let us know, tell somebody that you prayed with Terry and Renee and that you gave your heart to Jesus. We love you. God bless you.